if you opt out, you just <laughs> have to leave the meeting. So you know, there's that. All right. Um, ah, sorry. Uh, so welcome. Uh, this is uh, July 4th, 2023. Uh, while the rest of the country is sweltering, it's about 58 degrees, I think, in Berkeley right now. It's cold down here in the basement. Uh, you can tell when I'm wearing my cap that it's cool. So, um, And we are going to sit for about 20 minutes, and then I'm going to uh, talk uh, on a, uh, a Dharma topic um, that is uh, related to the uh, day. Um, and I, I, I realized as I was sitting this morning and I was kind of reviewing the things I wanted to talk about that, that there was a lot. So it might go on for a while. We'll have to see. Anyway, let's, let's start with the quiet part of the, of the morning. So just settling into your posture, having a sense of alignment and stability. Gone to the forest, to the root of a tree or to an empty hut. Establishing mindfulness in front of us. Ever mindful, we breathe in. Ever mindful, we breathe out. This is, this is how the Buddha starts his meditation instructions. And you can sit with your eyes closed or you can just lower your gaze if you're more comfortable, eyes open. Taking some time to settle the body, explore the sensations of the body. to really arrive in the body, to feel yourself in this simple activity of sitting and breathing. And the Buddha calls it the bodily formation. Pointing to the constructed nature of body, not a single thing, but many parts joined together. So we can feel the body in this way, as many different sensations. There might be certain areas that have a pleasant feeling, others that are less pleasant, some that are not really even felt particularly. So it can be helpful to scan the body for these different types of sensations, to see that the body is not one thing. And then we can tune in to the more subtle 
felt experience, the mood level or emotional level. Like physical sensations, this too can be felt. This level of experience is the bridge between mind and body, between thoughts and sensations. often overlooked, and yet very much the engine for mental activity. So to breathe with feeling, breathe with the feelings that are present without, without necessarily naming them, taking a stance, of liking or disliking, just feeling, allowing, receiving. So this attitude of openness and acceptance then allows for another level of settling. The body settles, feelings settle, the mind settles. We don't have to do anything or make anything happen, just observe and take the stance of the observer. Stepping out of the role of controller that we so often operate from. It's very natural and common for the mind to wander even when we're making an effort to stay present. Mind goes off into the future or the past. Central to our practice is the returning, coming back to the breath. And the key element of that is how we react when we realize the mind has wandered. As we start to learn this practice, there may be a tendency to judge ourselves, to think we're not doing it right or failing in some way because we're thinking, but this is a misunderstanding. When we do that, we're simply adding more fuel to the fire of thought. And so instead in that moment of knowing, knowing thought is happening, it's just a gentle 
kind of placing the thought down, letting it go, and returning to the breath, to the body, to the present moment. No need to do anything more than that. We're guided by kindness, compassion. We let go of judgment and striving.
Good morning again for those in the morning part of the country. Good afternoon to those in uh, afternoon times. And if anybody is visiting from uh, an evening world, welcome as well. Um, so, yeah, um, on the 4th of July, um, I learned... Uh, Years ago, uh, the, the Buddhist uh, name for this day is Interdependence Day instead of Independence Day, pointing to the interconnection of all beings and all things and, and um, trying to help us not to view uh, ourselves as separate, remind us that we're not separate. And of course we are, you know, we are interdependent with each other and especially with nature. And, and to the degree that we discount that and deny that uh, we suffer to that degree. Um, certainly in the recovery world, uh, interdependence is a foundational principle. It's it's really what what came to define the beginnings of the twelve step movement was realizing that we couldn't do it alone, that we needed other people at least and uh, community. So Thich Nhat Hanh kind of I think coined this this term and and uh, in thinking of him. Uh, I I got out this morning uh, the book called Interbeing, which is um, commentaries on these fourteen precepts that he wrote, uh, expressing uh, and kind of found founded in the idea of interdependence. And I think at the end of the morning I'll I'll read those uh, precepts, and we can sort of reflect on them. But, you know, one of the things that I thought of this morning as well, and I looked this up on my phone, but now I don't have my phone with me, so I'm going to look it up again, is Frederick Douglass's famous um, speech about the 4th of July. Uh, there it is. Um, where he it really says this isn't something uh, that, you know, a slave wants to celebrate. Uh, this was in 1852, so when slavery was still legal in this country. And, you know, and it just really points to, <laughs> you know, the reminder to, um, you know, reflect on all of what, what uh, America means, I think, and you know, uh, and you know, as I was thinking of that, of course, I th you know, I think of Thomas Jefferson, who sort of embodies this this tension between the aspiration that America represents, and that I don't, I don't know if how you, each of you feels about the idea of America, but but something about the idea of America really inspires me and, and moves me. And yet, uh, you know, there's, there's so much, uh, you know, more to be done, shall we say, or some, so many flaws. And so, you know, to have this person who writing about the idea of equality and freedom at this and, and seeming to be really inspired by it and moved by it himself, at the same time that he's holding slaves just speaks so much to that that tension and and you know we can call that hypocrisy but that doesn't really illuminate very much i don't think because as a you know as a person in recovery and as a buddhist i try to look at those moments of when i see uh this kind of 
tension. And when, when I find myself uh, wanting to judge, I, you know, I've been taught to, to look back on myself and see if I am free from that kind of hypocrisy. And, and there I see, uh, I don't, I prefer not to call it hypocrisy, but I see the same tension within myself between my own aspiration for enlightenment, you know, for, for the fulfillment of the Buddhist teachings and my own, you know, unwillingness and, or incapacity or whatever you want to call it uh, to completely live up to that and, and to see that I have those shortcomings and, and and so so to see this as both you know an expression of our our national uh personality our national character and and see that i have that those same tensions within myself and, and of course we're living in a time when it's easy to be swept away on the negative side of these of this conflict and that, you know, there's one of the, one of the branches of our government that's really pulling, pulling backward and, and expressing these worst impulses. Uh, and yet uh, it's not the whole story, you know, and, and it, uh, I, and many of you know that, I, you know, I have these sort of negative tendencies. I mean, I tend to really look at the dark side of things and the, the have the aversive and, and judgmental reaction and angry, you know, but I have to protect myself from those, those impulses because they only, you know, lead to more suffering. And I, and I know they do. And so I do try to, to, um, pull myself back from that edge. You know, you know, I, t I talked, um, on Friday, about uh, we were about to watch this documentary, which I mistakenly said was on Netflix. So if anybody went looking for it on Netflix, I'm sorry. It is on Hulu, if you happen to have access to that. In any case, it's a documentary called Anthem. And it's, it's uh, a story about trying to come up with a new national anthem. <laughs> that would be more inclusive and express all, you know, sort of include all of America and all of Americans in it. Um, and it's, it's very moving. We did watch it on Friday night and, and it's, it's really moving. And I was trying to find the lyrics because they actually wind up writing this song. They being this whole community that comes together through this uh, story these musicians start out uh, on kind of a road trip and go and visit different areas of the country and meet up with different musicians and songwriters and and ask them all what it would mean to have a a new national anthem and what it, what they would like to hear in that and and there's a lot of tension in that conversation uh, but they eventually bring all these people together and f write this song and then they the end of the documentary is them like recording it. It's very it's beautiful, beautiful song that's called We Are America. It's actually on Spotify, although there's some other <laughs> more fascist versions <laughs> or songs with that title. So you have to watch out. In any case, um, you know, as I was thinking about that documentary and that song, because part I, I, I I sense this whole tension within me, and it's it is expressed in this documentary. In the beginning of it, they they have Nicole Hannah Jones, who's the you know the editor of the sixteen nineteen project, saying like, "I don't think you can do this. I don't think you can write a new national anthem that people will accept." And and you know, and part of me was like, "Yeah, yeah," and and I'm thinking about all the people that are going to like troll the <laughs> the song or the documentary but then i realized no you know this is about an aspiration this is about hope this is about you know we can't give up on hope and that and and aspiring to be our best selves we can't we can't be in denial about uh, uh you know the negative side but but i know where that 
ends up if I just take that and I let that carry me. So it's always this, this, you know, external and internal tension. Uh, and mindfulness, this is how the Buddha talks about mindfulness, being mindful of the external, being mindful of the internal. And, um, you know, so, so just to see how that, that lives within me and within uh, you know, America, uh, it's just, it's really, um, it's really challenging, you know. Um, and, and, and that to me is the challenge of a spiritual path is holding it all, you know, and holding it all with love and compassion and wisdom, you know, not, not, uh, a, a superficial kind of positivity, uh, but also not just a cynical negativity, you know. Um, you know, I, it's funny, I, my daughter, you know, worked on the Biden campaign and she works now in politics in Washington for a progressive think tank. And I said to her a couple of years ago, you know, I said something to her about patriotism and she was like, I'm not patriotic. And I said, yeah, but look what you're doing with your life. <laughs> like you're working to make the country better and to improve the world, you know, but she couldn't really accept that. And it's just interesting. Um, but I, I think maybe she'll grow into that. Let's hope. Um, because, yeah, the, she's an, for all her cynicism and all her frustration, she's not giving up, you know. And And I have to admit that I gave up early in my life on, on America, you know, I, I didn't vote until I was well into my thirties because I just didn't believe that, you know, change was possible. I was, you know, traumatized by the sixties, frankly, and, and just felt like, okay, I'm just, you know, I'm not part of this. I'm just, um, a fringe person. So we have a visit from, uh, Olive today, who has not been visiting us for a while. So I apologize if that's disturbing or distracting. It's distracting me, I'll say that. <laughs> we've we've uh, sort of thought we had gotten control of Olive. We bang on the window and <laughs> shuts her up. So, um, yeah, let, let me... So uh, the other thing that came up as I was thinking about this was this... Uh, idea of of freedom, and a couple times in the in the past couple of years, I've I've read from uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi's essay uh, that is called uh, "The Taste of Freedom," because the Buddha says that his path has one taste, or the Dharma has one taste, and that is the taste of freedom, and and. Uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi then addresses these two types of freedom, what he calls the, the freedom of license versus the freedom, the sp spiritual freedom. The freedom of license is to do anything you want <laughs> and to like, you know, have the freedom to carry your guns and, and, uh, you know, and that's a very kind of American view of what freedom is. But of course, in our history, that's been a zero sum form of freedom. It's one in which some people get more freedom than others, right? Um, but uh, that aside, it's like drifting off into politics again, there, uh, he, he says, but that's not real freedom because no matter how free you are on the material level, on the behavioral level, if you contain within yourself greed, hatred, and delusion, you are always imprisoned by your own mind. And it's, it's becoming free from our, the imprisonment of our own minds that the path of Buddhism is about and the path of recovery is about right for us our addiction was was a prison 
and we were trapped in that. And so no matter how much political freedom we had, or, you know, we didn't have, we never had mental freedom, you know, which of course, you know, we, Vimala Sar and I are teaching at uh, Omega in August for anybody who's on the East Coast or would like to go to the East Coast. And, and we came up with a title called Free Yourself from from uh we didn't call it slavery so free yourself from mental something <laughs> i'll have to look it up anyway but we were we were trying to kind of evoke the marcus garvey line free yourself from mental slavery that that uh um bob marley turned into a beautiful song redemption song um and so this is what what Bhikkhu Bodhi really, you know, makes very clear and is always very precise and deep thinking uh, that, you know, mental slavery or mental imprisonment, uh, this is the, this is the real problem. And the, and that, of course, you know, freedom is possible even in the when external freedom is is taken away from us. And of course, some of the most inspiring spiritual stories uh, embody that. The, the Nelson Mandela's and even uh, Navalny in Russia now, how he seems to maintain some internal freedom even as he's imprisoned. So. So this again, I think, is a you know a tension in our culture and in us each as individuals, as we strive for some kind of freedom in our lives and control over our lives, and 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 then come to the limits of that and realize that's not that's not the way to freedom. And, and it's so interesting because then that brings us back to the the key Buddhist concept, which is that freedom comes from letting go. From not from not from acquiring some thing or some power, and, and this is why there's so much tension be, within us because all of our instinct and impulse moves us towards grasping, towards control, uh, towards ego, and when we come to understand, when we have insight into the causes of suffering, we realize, oh, all those instincts are actually pulling me towards agitation and stress and suffering, dukkha. But that's, I'm trained in that. I'm very good at that. So I have to learn how to, to uh, deprogram myself, somehow um, let, learn to let go when every impulse is, is telling me to hold on, to grasp. So, um, so let me go through the, the 14 precepts of the, uh, the Tepien order. And so this is something that, that uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, developed during the during the Vietnam War and and then this book uh, it says it was published in 1987 um, and it's it's called interbeing commentaries on the Tiep Hien precepts by Thich not Han and so they the, well, describe a a ceremony here. So I think I'd like to do this uh, as as a bit of a a ceremony or, or a ritual. So the way this is laid out is it is it it recites that there's a recitation of each precept, and then there's the question of have you done this in the past week? But I'm going to change that and say uh, suggest that we do this in the coming weeks, okay? And there will be a bell, this part of this as well, which uh, may, may be tricky because I don't, do, do you, when I ring the bell, when I'm on the uh, original sound off, do you hear it? Tell me if you hear this. 
Do you hear that? Yeah, you don't hear it. So I have to turn the, I'll have to turn the original sound. So you should hear this now. You hear that? Yeah. So that you know, you know what that is, because on Zoom, there's a, there's a noise suppressing mechanism on Zoom that keeps anything that isn't a human voice tries to suppress it. So that's why you don't hear bells. Uh, that's one of the selections. Okay, here we go. So you might want to t take this as a meditative um, reflection to so just sitting and you can close your eyes or just kind of get, take a couple breaths and come into the body. Well, the first precept, do not be idolatrous about or bound to any doctrine, theory, or ideology, even Buddhist ones. All systems of thought are guiding means. They are not absolute truth. This is the first precept of the order of interbeings. Consider reflecting and carrying this precept forward this week. Second, do not think the knowledge you presently possess is changeless, absolute truth. Avoid being narrow-minded and bound to present views. Learn and practice non-attachment from views in order to be open to receive others' viewpoints. Truth is found in life and not merely in conceptual knowledge. Be ready to learn throughout your entire life and to observe reality in yourself and in the world at all times. This is the second precept of the order of interbeing. Please reflect on this precept in the coming days. Third, do not force others, including children, by any means whatsoever to adopt your views, whether by authority, threat, money, propaganda, or even education. However, through compassionate dialogue, help others renounce fanaticism and narrowness. This is the third precept of the order of interbeing. Please reflect on this in the coming days. Fourth, do not avoid contact with suffering or close your eyes before suffering. Do not lose awareness of the existence of suffering in the life of the world. Find ways to be with those who are suffering by all means, including personal contact and visits, images, sound. By such means, awaken yourself and others to the reality of suffering in the world. This is the fourth precept of the order of interbeing. Please reflect on this in the coming days. Fifth, do not accumulate wealth while, li while millions are hungry. Do not take as the aim of your life fame, profit, wealth, or sensual pleasure. Live simply and share time, energy, and material resources with those who are in need. This is the fifth precept of the order of interbeing. Please reflect on this in the coming days. Sixth, do not maintain anger or hatred. 
As soon as anger and hatred arise, practice the meditation on compassion in order to deeply understand the persons who have caused anger and hatred. Learn to look at other beings with the eyes of compassion. This is the sixth precept of the order of interbeing. Please reflect on this in the coming days. Seventh, do not lose yourself in dispersion and in your surroundings. Learn to practice breathing in order to regain composure of body and mind, to practice mindfulness and to develop concentration and understanding. This is the seventh precept of the order of interbeing. Please reflect on this in the coming days. Eighth, do not utter words that can create discord and cause the community to break. Make every effort to reconcile and resolve all conflicts, however small. This is the eighth precept of the order of interbeing. Please reflect on this in the coming days. Ninth, do not say untruthful things for the sake of personal interest or to impress people. Do not utter words that cause division and hatred. Do not spread news that you do not know to be certain. Do not criticize or condemn things that you are not aware of, that you are not sure of. Always speak truthfully and constructively. Have the courage to speak out about situations of injustice, even when doing so may threaten your own safety. This is the ninth precept of the order of interbeing. Please reflect on this in the coming days. Tenth, do not use the Buddhist community for personal gain or profit or transform your community into a political party. A religious community, however, should take a clear stand against oppression and injustice and should strive to change the situation without engaging in partisan conflicts. This is the tenth precept of the order of interbeing. Please reflect on this in the coming days. Eleventh, do not live with a vocation that is harmful to humans and nature. Do not invest in companies that deprive others of their chance to live. Select a vocation which helps you realize your ideal of compassion. This is the eleventh precept of the order of interbeing. Please reflect on this in the coming days. Twelfth, do not kill. 
Do not let others kill. Find what other, whatever means possible to protect life and to prevent war. This is the twelfth precept of the order of interbeing. Please reflect on this in the coming days. Thirteen, possess nothing that should belong to others. Respect the property of others, but prevent others from enriching themselves from human suffering or the suffering of other beings. This is the 13th precept of the order of interbeing. Please, re please reflect on this in the coming days. Fourteenth, do not mistreat your body. Learn to handle it with respect. Do not look on your body as only an instrument. Preserve vital energies sexual, breath, spirit, for the realization of the way. Sexual expression should not happen without love and commitment. In sexual relationships, be aware of future suffering that may be caused. To preserve the happiness of others, respect the rights and commitment of others. Be fully aware of the responsibility of bringing new lives into the world. Meditate on the world into which you are bringing new beings. This is the 14th precept of the order of interbeing. Please reflect in these teachings, in these coming days. And so, in conclusion, Thich Nhat Hanh says, reciting the sutras, practicing the way of awareness gives rise to benefits without limit. I vow to share the fruits with all beings. I vow to offer tribute to parents, teachers, friends, and numerous beings who give guidance and support along the path. Thank you. Well, we have a few minutes left if anybody wanted to share anything. Uh, I have a question. Okay. This is my first visit with you. Oh. Thank you for hosting and providing the space. Um, is this a, a Donna, an, a, a situation where Donna is appropriate? And, and if so, how does that work? Um, thank you for that question. Uh, it is certainly a, a place where Donna is appropriate. And I think, um, and I think that uh, Monica has the uh, links for that, which she will put into the chat. <laughs> I'm guessing we can go to the website and... and yeah, and on my it. website, uh, under the About menu, there's something that says Donna supporting the teachings, and it gives, like, you know, various ways of electronically offering. But, yeah. Um, Great. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for asking. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you for your time. Um, so I was asked for a link. I, I don't have a link to this, but... 
what I just just read, but the book is called sorry, inter ah, typing is good. Interbeing. Someone put a link to the book. Uh, um, the only place chat. I could find it, Kevin, was on Amazon, but I put it in there. Yeah. All right. So yeah. Um, all right, good enough. It's there. Um yeah. Uh the, you know, there's some interesting history. I think in his book, uh, The Miracle of Mindfulness, you hear a little bit about the history of how this this arose and during the 60s when uh, Thich Nhat Hanh was, well, he was still in Vietnam. He was, they would go into villages that had been attacked and they would try to help people and, you know, offer medical services, spiritual Council and um, and eventually they got kind of driven out of the country. He was more or less exiled because uh, you know people who are making war don't um, don't like people who try to make them stop <laughs> or you know try to bring peace. It's like everybody wants peace except for you know what it requires. Um, yeah. So, uh, anything else? Anybody wanted to comment on? Yeah, Anne, go ahead. Yeah, hi. Oh, hi. I, was, I, was, I was hoping you would do something about Thich Nhat Hanh <laughs> today. <laughs> um, beautiful. Wow, that last one is just really hit me. I don't know, really. Um, when you're talking about freedom, I was and in being imprisoned, enslaved, and I thought of um, the the similes on the hindrances, yeah, the internal sort of imprisonment and right. like desires, like in debt and aversion, being gravely ill, but noticing the the freedom that comes when they're gone or when they're absent, you know, when desire is absent, and yeah, restlessness is absent, and uh, it's something I just thought of, but for the. Well, yeah, and that sutta um, in the uh, Buddhism 12-step class, um, I have that sutta ready for tomorrow. It's oh. it's Majjhima Nikaya 39. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the things I was going to bring out in the sutta uh, part of the class tomorrow. So, yeah, Good. yeah, yeah, it's interesting, the Buddha talk, because he, he uses slavery and imprisonment and being in debt and all these kind of ways of sort of forms of being the desert. yeah yeah being afraid of right yeah all of all your possessions yeah 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 um so yeah it's it's certainly worth reflecting on and just seeing what our relationship is in there and and again for me um, and and I feel this is captured somewhat in those precepts, is like the tension, right? Acknowledging the tension, not not sort of having this ideal of what I'm supposed to be, and then like, oh well, I'm not that, so I'm a failure. But rather acknowledging that this is this is very much uh, the tension of being a human being. We always have these aspirations, but you know, there's uh, we're, we're limited. You know, we can only do so much. We can, Perfection isn't really on the menu. Um, and and so how do we hold that? That to me is the bigger challenge. It's like, okay, because uh, there are levels of challenge, right? The, the first challenge is to be fully honest, to see the truth of your positive side and those destructive impulses. But then how to respond to that, how to hold that, how to bring compassion, how to bring love into that, this wider space of, of understanding of wisdom, which doesn't allow us to just like, oh, well, it doesn't matter. It's not apathy, but it's also not, you know, fighting. Uh, uh, this is the ongoing tension, I think. And, and I do think it very much reflects the history of our country. That's why I think it's so interesting. I mean, it's the history of the human race, but this country is sort of, you know, it's where I live. And so where I was brought up and 
but it is it is a country that really explicitly has these ideals you know that no other country you know at least before we were founded had these explicitly stated ideals that were then right at that moment <laughs> not being fulfilled at all you know <laughs> like wow how did you do that that was pretty amazing you know uh, you know, but it, yeah, I mean, I, I've got to bow to, bow to that because, as I say, I, I see the same thing within myself. So, so I, I hope that you all have uh, both a wonderful interdependence and independence day and uh, stay safe and uh, care for yourself and care for others. And peace. And don't burn the house down. And don't burn the house down, right? Or, or the neighbor's house. <laughs> <laughs> that was wonderful, Kevin. Thank you so much. Thanks, Steve. Very Have nice. a great day, you guys. All right. Take care. All right. Three, two, one. <laughs>